So welcome. Uh, we're glad that you are having a chance to view our presentation today. I want you to notice that our first picture up is again one of the Roosevelt elk. This one is standing in the brush keeping a close eye. Janet and Sherry uh, are both shooting pictures uh, and this guy was like a real poser. Uh, these are beautiful animals. This, this elk is standing in about three and a half to four foot tall grass. Uh, in fact, if you get real close up, there's grass seed on his forehead. Uh, it's just living in paradise here on the lost coast of California. These elk exist nowhere else in America. Uh, and so uh, sometime, should you have the courage just to drive down the road, you are in for a grand adventure. It is about a nine degree grade and you see the ocean out your windshield as if you're going to drive straight into it at about 900 feet up in the air. Fun drive, enjoyable. If you happen to know where it's at, it's worth the time to invest in it. And be careful in the early spring and summer because there are many ticks that would like to welcome you to the park. But it's a lovely experience. So Revelation is a book for today. It is a relevant book for right now. As you know in our presentation that we're approaching this, the book of Revelation are the thoughts of God. They're not your thoughts and they are not mine. This is how God sees political power. This is how he sees religion when it merges with political power. At the same time, when John is writing this down, then we clearly understand that this is the word of God that he is writing down. And the book tells you that God is on your side. So in chapter 13, part 2, we're going to begin actually in the middle of a sentence, and this book is about contrast. You'll see that contrast. Uh, it is a very interesting contrast as we go on the journey. So let's jump into our first part of chapter 13, verse 11. John writes, I beheld or I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. Now this vision reminds us that at one time the woman was sent into a wilderness area for the earth to protect her so she could survive. And so the earth was known for protecting the church. Now in this story a beast arises out of the earth and it turns against her. It says in verse 11 that he had two horns like a lamb. So when you hear the lamb-like horns, you're talking about a beast that looks like, sounds like, and talks like it is Christian. Because the lamb is always a symbol of Christ. But it says he had two horns like a lamb. Now, I'm not going to hold back. I honestly believe that when you look at the empires of the earth and the greatest empires, you look at Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, uh, pagan Rome, and then Christian Rome, that the next beast that comes on the world scene, in my opinion, based on the text, and I think there's good reason for it, is that we see a lamb-like empire rise up out of the earth in a wilderness area, and that simply matches historically the rise of North America in its vast wilderness. Again, let's continue. It says July 4, 1776, that is the title, just prior to the end of the 1,260 years, or that period known as the medieval times, 538 to 1798, a new political power emerged from the earth that was lamb-like in its authority or Christ-like and appears to be Christian in origin. The lamb-like symbol is the reason we say that. Can you think of a power that came on the global scene at this time? And of course that would be July 4, 1776, just before 1798. <clears throat> Those two horns of authority would be the Constitution and the Bill of Rights that make this beast lamb-like. They seem Christ-like by protecting individual rights, by protecting religious freedom, by protecting free speech, the pursuit of happiness, the exercise of a free will, if you would. Look at America. Look at how Christianity has flourished in that environment 
under the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And I'm saying that's a good thing. Please understand that. I am delighted to live in America, and I hope you are too, and I hope you value and love your country because of those two forms of authority that give us global influence. In fact, we have sought to spread that influence through democracy all over the world so other people on this planet could live in that freedom. The next slide <coughs> says that the horns represent authority. Now, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights set us apart from most all other nations. These two civil powers made this country the most powerful nation in modern times, if not in history. We have the global influence to fulfill prophecy. We came out of the wilderness, the earth itself, at the appropriate time to accomplish what this beast is supposed to do. But I want you to pay careful attention to what it's role is in prophetic history. It may surprise you. It says that this lamb-like beast, he spoke like a dragon. Now remember the dragon? Who is the dragon? That is Satan. So the vocabulary of this beast begins to change in the future. Verse 12. He exercises all the authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth and its habitants worship the first beast. So during the medieval period, what we saw was the rise of civil religious authority. We saw it under the rule of Catholic bishops. We saw it under the rule of Christian kings or Protestant kings. And the result was religious conflict, religious persecution, people being burned at the stake, if you would, people being incarcerated, put in prison. Uh, incredibly horrible things happened during that medieval era. But notice that the two-horned beast made or forced people to worship the first beast. Now pay careful attention. We're going to talk more about this. This beast will lead the world in making the image of the beast. Prophecy says this image will be the return of civil power and Christianity uniting in a religion with civil authority that will force worship with a death penalty. John wrote that. So I'm going to pause here and I'm going to clarify on this slide. If you want to look carefully at our own history, especially from the uh, 19, I would say, 1980s, mid-1980s, there has been a phenomenal movement amongst Christians, and the purpose is to move to influence civil power to do the bidding of Christianity. In other words... What I'm saying is that the church is wanting to legislate moral authority based on Christian principles through our government. The only reason the church needs that kind of power is because she is no longer happy with the power of the blessing of the outpouring of the Spirit of God in the upper room that was to empower the church to complete her mission with everything that she needed. For her to reach out and embrace civil power to legislate morality is a sign that Christianity has failed in her mission to impact society for the better. Therefore, they are reaching out to the government for greater authority and power. And the prophecy says that it will be enforced with a death penalty. So notice this slide on Revelation 13, 12. It says, whose fatal wound had been healed. So the beast that, whose fatal wound was healed, notice on this slide it says, civil, the civil religious era ended during the French Revolution. That was under the influence of a philosopher named Alexander Weislop, who was the founding father of atheism, civil authority that was what we know today as communism. 
France rejected the authority of the church, that means they rejected God. At the end of the medieval period, they arrested and imprisoned the Pope. It would be fully restored in the 1920s under Mussolini. Okay, so if that happened in about 1798, then understand that the church then was not fully restored to her glory until somewhere in the early to mid-1920s. However, this new image will only look similar. In other words, it's an image to the beast whose wound was healed, fatal wound, that means the beast died and went away and has returned. It's only going to look like it, it's not going to be it. Did you catch that? It is not going to be it. It will only look similar. It will embrace the whole of Christianity to encourage us with this new religious civil power to believe we're going to solve the problems of the world. I will say it again, when the church needs the power of government to accomplish her mission is because she has rejected the blessing and the power of the Holy Spirit and replaces it with governmental authority with a death penalty. There's more evidence to support this. It says in verse 13, chapter 13, verse 13, and he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of men. This united civil religious authority will not only take over civil power, but will do so demonstrating miraculous powers as evidence. It is so powerful it will deceive, if possible, the very elect. It will unite the church and state. And then the entire overview of Revelation now comes into play. The question of the entire book, who do you worship now, becomes relevant. Because if this beast can bring power and fire down from heaven. Notice what I wrote on this slide. Fire coming down from heaven takes us back to Mount Carmel with Elijah. God sent fire down to verify and accept his offering as confirmation of God confirming, confirming Elijah's power calling. Confirming Elijah's calling. Now let me get this straight. He was calling the nation of Israel back to God. So in Revelation chapter 13, verse 13, it says that there will be a delusion by Satan to make it look as though God is blessing this union of church and state. This satanic sign brings about a false revival and confirms the beast's power. It will appear to be true. It will deceive nearly everyone in the world. It will embrace the power of the state to accomplish its purpose. So understand, there is something in the future coming that fully involves the church and fully involves the state. Notice verse 14. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he has been granted to do so in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. In other words, it's an image. It is a likeness. It is not the same beast in history. It is an image or a likeness, which means it's now done by global religion, not a particular denomination. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 24. Please notice on this slide, there are three references. In one chapter, Jesus says three times, I am warning you, I am warning you, I am warning you. Why did he say it three times? Why is Jesus so concerned about deception? Why does he need to prophetically warn us three times? Well, we know now in Revelation that the great deception that is coming is that the church is reaching out, seeking the power of the state to recreate the medieval era of religious civil power again. Notice the words of Jesus. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. The second one. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. 
The third one, Matthew 24, 24. For false Christs and false prophets will appear, listen carefully now, and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect if it were possible. That verse perfectly parallels Revelation chapter 13. Satan has had centuries to plan his deception, to make it look lamb-like in every way, to make it look like, well, you know, we're a Christian nation. Maybe we need to go ahead and Christianize the government as well. It seems logical. Notice what Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2-4. to four. Not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposing to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. In other words, that was one deception Paul is writing about to warn the church in Thessalonia. Just if somebody says he's already come, ignore that. And I'm going to tell you there's been many, many false prophets who said Jesus already came on this date and this date and this date. But notice verse 3. Listen carefully now. This is your fourth warning. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawless, lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. What is a man of lawlessness? That is a man who has no regard for law. And I'm going to say that could mean that this man has no regard not only for the laws of God, but maybe even for the laws of man, that he's really willing in that rebellion to create something entirely new. Notice verse 4. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. So here Paul is warning us today that there is a man with no love, no respect for law of any kind, even divine, that is willing to set himself up and what claims to be God's temple in the future, proclaiming himself to be God. That sounds a lot like the beast in Revelation 13, who is going to not only create an image or a likeness to the medieval era, but he is going to go further than that. He is going to force everyone to worship that image that likeness to the beast. Verse 14 in Revelation, because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. That would be the reign of religious civil power over the era of the medieval time. Next slide. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast, that's the merger of church and state, so that it could speak and cause all who refuse to worship the image to be killed. That is a death penalty if you do not support that merger of those two great powers, the power of the church and civil authority, the power of the government. I, I am always concerned when I see fellow ministers who are willing to sell out in order to get influence and power with the state. It makes me highly uncomfortable because we're playing with beastly power. So when I see politicians who want to impose their religious beliefs through civil authority, I sit up and pay attention. You should too because Jesus himself warned Paul, the greatest evangelist of all times, warned that there are those who are willing to set aside the power of the Spirit of God who's enabled the church to accomplish completely all of her ministry and replace it with civil authority. You should be paying attention to politicians who want to mix religion with civil authority. And folks, it's happening all around us every day right now. That is present experience today, right now. Verse 16, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive the mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. 
So here's the mark of the beast. Oh my goodness. I've heard about computer chips. I've heard about tattoos. I've just pretty much as you have heard it all until it's just, frankly may I say, it's just mostly nonsense. So what is the answer? It says that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So let me make this really simple. The, the mark on the forehead of the beast is where you think. So the mark of the beast means that you have aligned your thinking with the beast. And if it's a mark on your right hand, then what we're saying is that your hand in its action supports the beast. It, it isn't a visible thing, it's symbolic that what you think and what you do by how you act and how you behave, that you are in harmony with the image created by this beast. And there's economic sanctions made. But there's more in this text. No one can buy or sell, that would be economic sanctions, except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So, I just want to pause for a moment. The hand, what one does reveals their loyalty. The forehead, what one thinks and speaks reveals loyalty. Are you with me on this? Do you understand the mark of the beast. Now we've talked about under the fifth seal those who have the seal of God. The seal of God would be a seal here on the forehead that you think the things of God, you think what God thinks. You hear what he says and you think about him. And you do what you do based on the compassion and the love of God towards others in the world. So you have the seal of God as a contrast and you have the mark of the beast. Those two forces are the last two forces on the world. Now some people are afraid of Islam becoming the great power and that's going to be the scary thing. Some were afraid communism was going to be the great power. That would be my father's generation and there was great fear. There was communists everywhere under the McCarthy era. That was a great fear. I am telling you the great fear in the last days of earth's history is the merger of church and state altering your loyalty to God. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Now once again, rock stars have made a fortune marketing 666 on their albums because it speaks to the energy and the natural rebellion of teenagers. And some of them actually believe it. I don't want to take away from that. Some of it's actually very dark and very evil. But it says, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man. Wisdom means you think this through carefully. It is the number of a man. Now man was created on the sixth day Man's number is 666, the sixth day of creation. Contrast that to God finished the creation on the seventh day. Seven is God's number. And God set aside the seventh day to celebrate his creative power. His power to create a new heart and a new mind in you through Christ. Now what can man create in you that's new? So if the issue at the last days is 6 versus 7, the earth that protected the woman and the earth that raises up a beast who persecutes the woman, the church, that contrast, then I pose this question to you. How do you know if you worship the beast or you worship the creator God? Well, if seven is God's number and the seventh day is the one day he said was the day to recognize him as creator, then who you worship and when you worship becomes the symbol 
that you are faithful to the Creator God. But man has created worship days as well. So we have tradition of first day worship, which is man's day, not God's day, through tradition. So which one is the day that the beast is going to proclaim? Is he going to proclaim the day of God on the seventh day? Or is he going to proclaim man's day? This is wisdom. It is the number of man. And his number is 666. Now, I didn't put it on a slide for you, but I can tell you that if you do research in history, there is a number chart that was used. Babylonian uh, number numerical system was based on six. Six and 60 in their concept of mathematics. And they have a chart that's so big that if you take all the numbers and add them this way or add them this way, they always come up to 666. When we get to Revelation 18, it is the story of the fall of Babylon. Babylon's number is six as well. And that is man's method and system of worship, not God's. The question in Revelation, my last slide, who will you worship? A lamb-like beast? Or will you worship a loving Savior who has resolved in Revelation 1 the sin problem of the world? He has set you free from your sin and he invites you to celebrate him every seventh day and worship him, the creator of the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. That's Revelation 14. Oh. I'm sorry, I guess I have another one. The beast. Salvation by works. Church and state unites to legislate morality. Worship by man's tradition. Worship by force on man's chosen day. Or have the seal of God. Live by faith alone in Christ. Holy Spirit convicts of morality. Worship the creator God on his day and enter into creation rest. Which will you have as a mark? The seal? or the mark of the beast. How will you know what the mark of the beast is or what the seal of God is? It is how you worship. How you worship. Need you to process that. Need you to think about that. Why did Revelation go into such details about this story? because it is the plan Satan has to corrupt the church and turn it away from God to himself. Because Satan seeks self-worship. It's all about him, who he is, what he does, what he wants. It is called selfishness, manifested in the nature of man. There's a contrast. Beasts or Christ? Now, Sherry's picture for the end of our presentation. Opposing seagull. Sitting there, proud and lovely, sitting on the beach. What you don't know is there's about, as would be normal, 500 other seagulls around. But this one decided just to stand there and look at us and say, hey, I'm a pretty amazing bird. I hope you enjoy that picture. Thank you, Sherry. You guys have a blessed day. Go back and read chapter 13 carefully and ask yourself the question, who do I worship? Take care.